This week on the Backtable Podcast. There's no way to make this not an awful process. There's just a way to suffer less, I think. Like, nobody wants to be a bad doctor. And nobody wants True. other people to think they're a bad doctor. And that is, right. in essence, what this whole thing is about. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So until we really internalize that, you can still be a good doctor. Like, you are a good doctor. And you got sued. Like until those are not mutually exclusive in your head, then there's probably work to do. You need to take care of yourself. And to do that, you probably need a professional, right? And there, the rest of it, you can find, pay cash, whatever. Talk, call it counseling sessions, call it coaching sessions, whatever, mm -hmm. whatever you want. Take care of yourself first. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Backtable Podcast. If you are a new listener, welcome to the show. For all of our regular listeners, welcome back and thank you for listening. You can find all previous episodes of the podcast on iTunes, Spotify, or our website, backtable.com. Subscribe to the podcast, leave us a written review, or reach out to us on social media. Let us know how we can make this podcast a better resource for our community, and we're going to do our best to make that happen. We've picked a topic today that is a direct result of our complication survey that we sent out a few months back. So for those of you guys that listen regularly, we appreciate you guys filling out the survey, getting us some suggestions. And from those suggestions, we got a good topic picked out today. We're going to be talking about medical malpractice claims. To help us with the discussion, we have Dr. Gita Pinsa on the show. Dr. Pinsa is an ER physician, that's emergency room physician, who practices at the Alpert School of Medicine at Brown. And famously, or at least famously to me, she's the creator and host of the podcast, Doctors in Litigation, The L Word. Gita, welcome to the show. Hi, thanks for asking me. Yeah. Um, we also have co-host today, uh, creator of another great podcast, Dr. Aaron Fritz. Uh, you guys may have heard of him before. Uh, Aaron, welcome to the show. Thank you, Chris. So let's get into it. Gita, one thing that I wanted to cover was just your backstory and, and specifically, like, how did you get interested in this topic? Well, uh, that's a very long story. Um, it's a, I know, but... I know, because there's a whole podcast about it, but it's kind of a loaded <laughs> question. Yeah, um, I think the the shortest answer to that question is that I myself was sued. Um, it was a doozy of a case. It lasted 12 years, two prolonged jury trials. I was the sole uh, physician defendant. 28 million dollar demand. It was bad, and I got named when I was about five years out of residency, and uh, no one had ever talk to me about what to do after I was named. The implication was I shouldn't be named if I was a, a well-trained physician and I adhere to all the risk management rules, then it shouldn't happen. And so when it did happen, I, I did not even have, I didn't have the first idea of what to do. I didn't know who to call. I didn't know if I could call anybody. I did not even know that the first step was to talk to my carrier. I had no idea. And I did not do well mentally with this at all. I had a lot of shame and guilt and very complex emotions that we can get into later, but um, it really took quite a toll on my personal life, my professional life. I did win at trial in 2011, which was, how many years was that in? That was about seven years in. Um, and then the case was appealed. My victory was appealed and the verdict was eventually overturned. And that's a whole long story because that I couldn't believe that happened. And then I went to trial again in 2018, but somewhere between 2015 and 2018, when I found out that I was going back to trial, I really hit this sort of rock bottom about it. It had been so long and I was so tired and I was just so burned out is probably a good word, but it had just like, you know, a decade basically of this thing grinding on. And I really had a sort of sink or swim moment in there. And I started realizing that I needed help and I didn't know where to find it or how to ask for it. And, but I started a process that turned into this whole change in the way I see my career and myself and litigation in general. And then when I finally knew I was better and I knew there was a different way to think about this and a different way that we should be approaching this on a cultural level in medicine, when I had the skill set to teach about it, and that's a whole other story, but somehow I, you know, along the way, I picked up some podcasting skills and things like that. And then I realized, like, you know what? 
I think I could do something with this. I think I could do something with this. And I think I could help people. And if even if nobody listens to it, like, you know, it'll feel better if I get out what I want to say. But it turns out people listen. And that's that's nice. And I'm really glad that it's made a little bit of an impact. So what you're referring to is like uh, the process, like once you're on the other end of this, like uh, putting together your podcast, uh, the L word. Yeah. So somewhere in there, I guess, if if you want to hear the rest of the story in there's so many parts of this story, but in in 20, like 2014, 2015, somewhere around there. So this whole thing, I saw this patient in 2006. So that is crazy to me that the whole process started in 2006. Yeah. 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 I mean, when you want to think about it, I had in the span of this trial, I I was pregnant with my youngest child at the time I saw this patient. And when it all wrapped up, like she was in middle school, it was kind of this dysfunctional family member for a really long time. But somewhere in there when I was kind of transitioning, like, gee, I need to either, I either got to leave medicine or I got to learn how to like it again. I joined an academic faculty. And that wasn't even, things things were happening at my institution and we were getting absorbed and I had the option, do I want to try and join this academic faculty? And I thought, yeah, it'd be kind of, I think it'd be fun. I think it'd be fun to learn how to teach and and do stuff. And maybe that'll bring some of the spark back because I don't want to do this job anymore if I really can't find a way to like it. And the thing is about academics is you need a niche, right? Sure. So I, I didn't have a niche. I've been a generalist in a community ED for a while. And um, the residency director asked me, like, well, you know, here's here's a problem we have. The residents would like to start using some of these blogs and podcasts and things in emergency medicine, this free open access medical education movement. They'd like to use that for education, but we have to standardize it and we have to blah, blah, blah. Like, can you help with that? I was like, uh, sure. I knew nothing about any of it. But I was like, OK, I think I could probably learn how to do that. And so I I did. I started dipping a toe into like educational technology and educational social media. And then eventually um, I ran a course, like an online course for the residents where I would curate materials for them. And then the residents wanted to make a blog. So we made an educational blog. And that was a whole interesting education in itself. And then they were like, hey, people are podcasting. Can we start a podcast? And I was like, uh, sure. Well, I guess so. (laughs) So so I took a course in podcasting. I really liked it. I really liked it. I loved that. I liked editing. And I liked and I wound up doing a podcast for the Academic Emergency Medicine Journal. And they have a little thing with her. So I really learned how to do like distance interviewing. And I learned how to do things about recording and all sorts of stuff that I'd never had. And then something clicked somewhere towards the end of um, preparing for the second trial where I was like, you know what? I know how to remote interview people. I have a big enough social media. I'm not not huge, but I don't have a blue check by any means, but like (laughs) enough people, like I'm in enough of these like online groups and stuff that I could probably find people and I know how to edit. So what if I went online and I asked doctors if they wanted to share their stories about malpractice litigation? And I so I put this this little, you know, little call out on social media and I could not believe the response I got that people want to like I said, like, I don't really want the specifics of your case, like in general, like unless it's done. But I want to know what it took out of you. I want to know what it felt like. I want to know how you survived. Did you survive? Like, are you still in medicine? That's what I want to know. And I got like, oh, my God, like email after email, message after message, like people we're dying to talk about this. Like, no, it's like no one ever asked them before. Mm-hmm. Probably no one ever did. And so I started doing these interviews with doctors about what it felt like to get sued and what their stories were. And then I started assembling them into these podcasts. And eventually it became this sort of self-contained curriculum, I think. It's not really an ongoing, it's not a podcast where I do one. It's not like this, where you're continually adding like new and new guests, blah, blah, blah. Like maybe it'll morph into that someday. But I really design it more as an audio curriculum where you could just start at the introduction and listen all the way through. And then when you were done, you would have a pretty good idea of what this whole thing was about in terms of, I mean, a little bit of practical knowledge, deposition, trial know-how, that kind of stuff. I tried because I I do believe that know-how is the antidote to anxiety, but also really hearing these other doctors tell their stories so that you could realize like you are as alone as you feel in this, like you feel like you have all these complex emotions and you feel like you're the one who screwed up because you can't handle it because we're supposed to handle stuff, right? So when you hear all of these other practicing physicians who are trying to tell you that these feelings are normal, like these are, this is a normal expected human reaction to a very outsized stressor, 
But it, it's not enough for me to say that, right? If you hear sure. doctor after doctor after doctor after doctor tell you this is part of the process and this is what can happen if you're not mindful and these are my stories, then I think you start to get somewhere in terms of an individual. Phys- now, we're so hard headed, you know, like I think we really <laughs> we think we're supposed to be a particular way. It is very hard to change a doctor's mind about how to think, how to be, how to act, what's professional, what's acceptable. Mm -hmm. I totally get that. I'm not a very woo-woo person, you know? Like, I'm not, in terms of, like, you know, the self-help books and all this other stuff, I was so resistant to anything like that. I went into emergency medicine in, you know, in the 90s when, like, not a lot of women did, and I thought of myself as this... I mean, I, you you see me. I'm this sort of diminutive little person, but I saw myself as a big dog. Like, I did not, you know, that thing about how, like, a big dog, like, a little dog doesn't know it's a little dog. Like, then, yeah, yeah, like, that's a how little you dog, you do anything. That's how I felt, right? I was, I was a big dog. I could run with anybody. Took a lot of mind changing. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's one of the things about your podcast. Like, I thought it was a nice balance. Uh, one, also to comment, like, to me and, and to our audience, it felt like more like uh, like I was listening to something like, like the Wondery series or like a serial podcast in that, like, it felt very self-contained, like a lot of stories that build into the episodes. But then there's like, you know, there's chapters and then there's like an overarching story that you kind of follow, which is your story throughout. I thought it was really well done. Such a high, like, great production value and just like, from my standpoint, I thought the uh, musical cues, I thought like the music that you added to it was so well done. Thank you. I know Aaron and I have geeked out on it a little bit before. Well, it's very inspiring for us because you're, I mean, we listened to it probably two years ago, mm-hmm. one or two years ago. And this was when our audio was admittedly horrible and we had no intro music or extra music. And I'm I'm sharing this with Chris. I'm like, this is what we got to strive for, mm-hmm. Chris. This is what we we got to get, we got to improve our audio. We got to get some music. And uh, that's when it started coming together. So just as a fan, you know, you inspired us to be a better podcast. Just to I let you know. am so happy to hear that. And for me, it was like this self-actualization process, because mm-hmm. not only was I making something that I thought would be helpful out of these experiences that were painful, I was doing it in a way that was creative. And I use it as sort of this creative flex for myself. Like I had just learned these new skills and part of it was just like all right well like i learned these new things so what can i what can i do and so a lot of it is just me trying to be a better editor and podcaster and just you know i didn't know that people were going to listen to it i didn't right. i really didn't right yeah. so i thought i would just make this thing and like maybe i'd send it to my friends and you know it was free i would let people listen to it i mean i wanted it to be presentable enough but i learned a lot while I did it. There was a lot of like on the podcast, even now when I listen to it, I'm like, oh, I should have done that differently. I'm like, oh my God, there's like the music too loud there. And so, Uh, you know, there's still things that I would have changed. I don't know if you remember, but um, Aaron Shiloh is the one that introduced us. Yes. You remember that? Yes, I do. I do. Right. I said it to to my friends. (laughs) Yeah. Did you guys go to medical school together? Yeah. We went to Penn together back in the day. Yeah. Back in the day. Yeah. Hi, Aaron. You listening? <laughs> yeah, <hey>, Shiloh. <laughs> I hope Shiloh. he's listening. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll definitely send it to him. Thanks yeah, for sure. the intro. Yeah, yeah, no, Aaron and I got way back. All right, so one of the things I wanted to cover, uh, because there's there's a lot of ground to cover in your uh, podcast, but one of my favorite episodes was episode two, when you get the notice of the malpractice event or, you know, what's called getting served. And so first, I just wanted to like start with some what I thought were like fantastic, like on the ground tips. Like, so if this happens to a young or old physician, but if, if this has never happened to you before, like what are some of the things to the do's and don'ts, like the basics, uh, basic rules of the road on like what hap- what to do once you get served? So the the first thing is, well, it's very hard not to be completely shocked when it happens. You might You might know that something's coming, someone's requested records or something like that. You're not gonna know when they serve you. And it varies state to state how it happens. So it can be, you can just get like a registered letter in some states and it's not very dramatic, except you see that there's a, you know, a a lawyer's company's name in the return address and then your heartbeat starts going up. But at least you can open that in the company of your own home. But in other places, it can be a sheriff that serves you. Might just be a process server, but you can be served at work, can be served at home. There are lots of stories in there about people being served at strategic times where the the plaintiff's attorney chooses a time 
and a place that's meant to be the opening move in uh, a process that's really meant to grind you down. So I've talked to physicians who were served at Thanksgiving, on Thanksgiving, by a sheriff at their door in front of their whole family. Physicians who were served at work in front of their colleagues, in front of everybody, by a sheriff in, in a big production. There's a lot of production value in that. I know a physician who was served the day after her father's funeral, and it was a mm. smaller town, and everybody, her dad had been a doctor. Um, everybody knew uh, what was going on, and so it was just time to be as painful as possible. Obviously, these things are meant to put you in a certain mindset, and a little bit of that's inevitable, but sometimes if you know that that's a possibility ahead of time, like this is just, to them, this is a strategy move. This is a strategy move, and you can let it affect you as much as as much as you allow it to affect you. But that's the first thing to know, is that the service of process can be a pretty dramatic event. It's also legally necessary. You have to, you, you have to be served with the papers um, in order for the lawsuit to proceed. Um, so it's, it's necessary that it's done correctly. Uh, and it varies from state to state. So it's actually kind of important to know, like, what are the rules in your state? Because they don't serve you right, then, you know, you actually... Might be off the hook. Yeah, you have some grounds for actually getting the whole thing thrown up. The other point is, though, that you can't ignore it. I've also known of physicians who are like, I can't deal with this. And they put it in a drawer and they shut it. But if you don't respond, then you risk losing by default, essentially. Mm -hmm. So it has to get dealt with. So the first thing that you have to do is call your carrier. So you have an insurance carrier. You don't talk to anybody else. You call that carrier. And they are going to start the process of initiate a claim. And then they're going to tell you what your next steps are. The step after that is that you're going to need an attorney. And that's a whole other, that's a whole other discussion about how that happens, because it really depends on your policy. Sure. Well, what are some also some things to do? Because like you said, like this uh, getting served can be like the first shots fired in like a, a long, drawn out battle. But what are some things that maybe some physicians may react to do that maybe you shouldn't do, like some pitfalls? Because I can imagine, and I don't know if you feel the same way, Aaron, but like, you know, if you're, you're getting served, like the first thing I would want to do is like, as soon as I see like who it's from, like, look up that patient, like what mm -hmm. happened? What was that story? And like, so I, I wanted you to just speak a little bit to that point of like, what are some things not to do in this situation? Okay, there's a few. Uh, the first is don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> do not look up the patient. Okay, Don't look it. up the patient. So the thing is about EMRs now, they've got their uses. Um, in terms of litigation, they can be your absolute worst enemy. Uh, so don't look up the patient. Don't do anything with the chart. And what you can do, your, your attorney's going to get the records. Everyone's going to have a printout for you to look at. You can do all that stuff. Sometimes... Some people sort of have worked around where if your group is also being sued or if there's um, if the hospital is being sued, a representative of that larger group can access the chart. Because every time someone access the chart, accesses the chart, the chart knows who accessed it, where they accessed it from. And then the corollary to that is that if you make the mistake of accessing it, like, OK, that's one thing. The chart also knows how long you spent on a given page. It knows what how you know what computer you accessed it from were you at home or were you at a computer in the hospital and it knows if you changed anything it knows if you added anything it knows if you put in an addendum and it knows exactly when that addendum went in it knows if you altered your physical exam so cases now uh it's pretty impressive how many cases are lost based on panic editing of the chart I think, and I mean, most physicians don't mean to be committing fraud. They are, but I mean, most physicians don't mean to be doing that. Or even if, even if it's not, even if it's just like, I, I never charted this particular thing and about this interaction and I want to make sure that's in there. Don't do it. Resist any urge to do that because they will know exactly when you put that in and it's going to look so bad for you that your case is going to be, it's just going to be over. So don't make and try the easiest thing to do is just to not access the chart and to ask somebody else to get the records on your behalf. Somebody in your, you know, your insurer or your hospital system, if they're being sued with you or whatever. But somebody else has got to get that record for you. And then yeah. don't text anybody. Don't text people about it. Don't like not don't email people about it. Like nothing that's not a protected communication with your insurer or your, and your 
attorney. Nothing that can be because people don't realize like phones can be can be called in as, as for evidence. Uh, emails can be discoverable. And every single thing that you do on the chart is discoverable. And they know exactly when, exactly who and where you were. So I noticed like you mentioned two things like text and email, like kind of the written word. But is it is it fair game to call other people to talk about it? So, yeah, you can call people. Um, so calling people to talk about it is, I know it's very foreign to right. <laughs> younger, younger, perhaps younger listeners, right? Like no, no one calls anybody <laughs> anymore. But yeah, if you're going to talk about now, we'll talk about what you can talk about. But if you're going to sure. tell somebody like I am sued, I'm getting sued, I'm devastated. You know, this is the basics of what's happening to me. Like that's a phone call. That's a phone call. That is something. And they can still, like, be deposed later to say, what do you remember? They don't often do this, by the way, but sure. they could. Like, that's the whole thing. Talking about it with other people is not because not it's illegal. It's because those conversations can be discoverable. Someone may get pulled in and get deposed. Like, what did they tell you? What did they, what did they say, right? Those kind of things aren't often fruitful because, you know, you're probably not going to, you know, you're probably not, your friend called you. You're probably not going to say that they told you, oh, my God, I totally screwed everything up and I did this and I did that. And so, you know, regardless, but that's the fear. Like we're rule followers. So right. we know we're not supposed to talk. But I mean, you take it with a grain of salt, but you also like need to know what the rules are and not be dumb about it. You really have to be careful who you're talking to, what you're saying, how you're saying it. Keep it really about the emotions involved not about the facts specific to the case. Those are things that you discuss with your attorney and your insurer. And that's pretty much it. I, I think it would be a little bit, especially the, the stress of being served and, uh, you know, probably therapeutic to like call up a mentor, somebody you trust, somebody in your, you know, my wife's a physician. Clearly, I'd be talking to her mm -hmm. probably every day about it. But, uh, you know, any advice around that, like talking to mentors about it, I guess, you kind of touched on that, like, but I think that's where Chris is also getting at is it's like, you got to be able to really, you know, obviously you want to, you want to take you, you want to go through the proper steps legally uh, and, and cover yourself. But, you know, there's got to be a, like a, a stress reliever. And do you have any advice around that? You should talk to people, right? You should tell your spouse. It doesn't even matter whether your spouse is medical or non-medical. I know people yeah. who have refrained from telling their spouse for years. It's smart people, like people you really think would know better who just didn't tell their spouse about it because they thought they weren't supposed to. When they say don't talk about it, that means don't talk about it, right? So that sure. means they didn't tell anybody. They didn't tell yeah. anybody anything. And honestly, your attorneys are fine with that. They don't care if you, like, they don't care if you talk to people. I mean, no, I take that back. They care if you talk to people. They don't care if you can, you know, have an outlet for your emotions or not. As long as you can show up and be a defendant, they would much rather you shut your trap. And don't say anything to anybody, except that that is there is no other scenario that I can think of in which you traumatize an individual. And we can talk about all the ways that litigation traumatizes physicians, where you traumatize an individual and then tell them, don't talk about it. You are not allowed to talk about this with anybody. So just suck it up. It's going to last for a while. And you're going to be under this ongoing, you know, repeat stressor after stressor after stressor in this process, but do not talk about it. Can't talk about it. And, you know, we're all bred a certain way where we, we're used to not talking about stuff. We don't talk about patients. We don't talk about, you know, we know we understand HIPAA, all that stuff. So we, we try to take that seriously, but this is a very bad idea because we know that the way to process trauma is to talk about it with people whom, you know, or with professionals or with people whom you trust. And so the heart of your question is, how does a doctor do that? And there are a few ways, all of which are, okay, so one of them, one of them is M&M, right? Where if you want to know, did I do something wrong, right? If a case is referred to M&M, I want to caution you because it's not always undiscoverable, but it's safer than most, right? If you want like people to really talk about this thing and you do it as a hospital-based M&M, some entity that has protections and you only got to check in your state, what are the protections? It is typically very hard for that to be. Now, most people don't want their cases discussed at Eminem. That's sure. a whole that's a whole other thing, right? But that's one thing where you can sort of get at the get at the medicine of it. Other than that, what you want to know is you just want to know from people who know how to do what you do, did I do the right thing? That's what you want. Did I do the right, right thing? Did I did I really screw up here? Would you have done something different? You need that you, we need that. We need to know that. And so other options are 
if you are if you are being sued as an entity, right? Most people are like you're being sued in your group, you're being sued in some somebody else who is in there with you that's not a competitive defendant, right? They're in there with you. Then those are safer discussions. Better had with an attorney present, but those are safer discussions. And otherwise, you keep it vague and hypothetical. Mm -hmm. Vague and hypothetical. So hypothetically speaking, if you saw, you know, like whatever, change this age, change this thing. If you did this, blah, blah, blah. I just want to know, given these set of circumstances, what would you do? Right. You have to be able to sort of because you're stuck, you can't not talk about this, but you can't be dumb about it either. And all you have to do is to be able to say when you are deposed, I have not discussed the details of this case with anyone but my attorney. And the devil is in the word details, right? I have not discussed the details of the case with anyone by attorney. I have not discussed my care in this case with anyone, anyone but my attorney. But you have to do a little bit of that, I think, just to get some sort of closure on whatever whatever it is that happened to you. But just be smart. Just be smart about it. I think that's like the common theme of this is that, you know, there's there's an outlet for this. You can talk to people and it's certainly encouraged to talk to people. You just have to be smart in the way that you discuss things. Be and smart in the way that you discuss things. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the more the more it is focused on the emotions, the better I recognize that it's super hard. Like, let's say you have a like a, a pediatric case, right? Like that's a huge part of what just happened I mean, for us. Like I took care of this two year old and they died. It's OK to say that. That's not giving away the case details. That's not saying anything about your choices and care. You're like, you were involved in a case where a two-year-old died and I'm getting sued for it. You almost don't have to say anything else about that. Right. What if whoever you talk to is going to know, holy moly, are right. you okay? Yeah. Right? The gravity of that is inherent in that statement. So, yes, it has to be talked about. Just be smart about how you do it. So one of the things that I wanted to go back and talk about was – all the ways in one in that like getting served for to going to trial like this whole process it can be a long it's a long game it's a long drawn out process and like you said earlier it's designed in a way to like kind of grind you down but can you also speak to a little bit of about the trauma that and i don't think that's like um an overuse of the word but in the, in the ways that you were traumatized by undergoing like litigation or malpractice yeah. And it's funny that you say that because I was really resistant to that word, too. But when you think about it, for most of us, medicine is like a huge part of our identities. Like, this mm -hmm. is who we are. And what malpractice litigation is designed to do is designed to try. It's basically engineered to traumatize the doctor. That's what that's what the system is supposed to do. That is what plaintiff's attorneys know all about the psychology of doctors. Mm -hmm. Like they're not they're good at what they do. They're not dummies. They might not know medicine, but they know how to do what they do. Right. And so psychological manipulation is built into this. Right. And so they know your weaknesses. They know physicians as a whole. They know your weaknesses. And they this is a psychological game. And so we as people who are dedicating our lives to helping people, we have this ethos of doing this for the betterment of humanity. And there's there's so much of this is weaved into who we are so that when someone comes and accuses you of either deliberately or indeliberately, or whether it was your just because you're just so bad at what you do, but like harming someone, like really harming someone. That's pretty traumatizing. It's pretty traumatizing. And so and then it just kind of the hits just keep on coming a lot of the times. Now, new, we're not talking about nuisance stuff. We're not talking about where things are clearly like a money grab. We're talking about things where someone is telling you like you hurt this person because you are bad at what you dedicated your life to. I know you've dedicated your life to it, but you suck at it and you really hurt people and you shouldn't be doing this. So a trauma is probably not too light a word. I mean, not too heavy a word to use. Um, and so, OK, there are a lot of different reactions that people can have it's as, as different as personalities are. But some pretty classic reactions and they'll sort of change as the whole process goes on. But, the, you know, when you're being served, there is almost this sort of like shock and denial thing that happens and then typically people can start to process it a little bit as the weeks go by and then be ready to face okay what's next but these lingering emotions of shame guilt feeling shame is the big one people don't want to people don't want to talk about because they're ashamed of what happened guilt whether or not you had anything to do with what happened you just feel bad that something bad happened to one of your patients right because we are human beings that actually care about our patients. So when something bad happens to them, we feel bad about it, right? I lay awake at night, like, I don't know how many nights, just thinking like, oh my God, this poor woman, 
the things that happened to her, like, did I do something wrong? Did, I didn't, I mean, I didn't think I had, but like, clearly something had been missed. So how did that happen? Right. Just you running that tape over and over again. If you are someone who suffers in any way from imposter syndrome, or you think that you, you know, and most of us as physicians, if you don't question yourself like 10 times a day, are you even practicing medicine? Right. right. So that's going to get a lot worse. All sorts of uncertainty. And then, you know, you add that to the whole burnout culture in medicine right now where you're just like, oh, my God, this is just one more blow. One more thing. I can't take one more day of this. And then you're afraid. You don't know what's going to happen. You're afraid of your for your finances. You're afraid for your family's finances. What's at risk? Like, what could I lose? What if they ask for more than my policy allows? So there's a whole real complex stew. And that's going to be a little different for everybody. But the stew is pretty, it's pretty bitter for most people when, especially when it's a serious case and you are being accused of something really bad. Since we're kind of getting into the mental health aspect of it a little bit, one of the questions from our audience is, how do you seek help for, for counseling and, and kind of when, and, and can that be used against you, you know? Okay. So this is a very complex question. Yeah. And it varies absolutely from state to state. What has to be reported to your medical board um, or your hospital when you're applying for privileges? There's a big move right now for all states to remove questions about non-concurrent mental health treatment or mental health treatment that might affect your practice, right? Because this is not just for litigation stress. This is for any mental health thing. There are studies mm -hmm. that show that physicians are very afraid to seek mental health um, support because they're afraid of losing their licenses or losing their jobs. And those aren't overstated fears. Um, so there's a lot that we can do in terms of working on making sure that that's not something that happens. But I will say that in most states, it's pretty tough to get mental health records um, entered into, you know, they're, I mean, I won't say they're not discoverable because they are um, in some states, but it's hard to do. The, the bar um, to obtain them is much higher. So I do recommend that you figure out how to talk to someone about it. So the first step, I think, is is peer support. And so some hospitals do have formal peer support programs. Again, they are structured so that the peer is hopefully trained a little bit in in how to how to do this um, and to watch for things like suicidality and all the other sorts of things. Doctors are pretty good at that, but also in deflecting talking about the details of the case. Right. right. So any time that you're going to be talking about this with a professional, my advice is to try to minimize, again, vague and hypothetical, vague and hypothetical. Right. This isn't about like the details of the things that you think you did wrong. Right. But in terms of talking about the emotions, I think it's super important. It's super important to be able to get that support. So either peer support, spousal support, friends, family, all of those things. And then definitely I would consider therapy. I wound up talking to a, it was a long way in, but I definitely wound up talking to a therapist. I paid cash. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, I, I'm as paranoid as anybody. Yeah. But I. You know, I'm I'm honest when I answer any of those questions, like, does any of this affect my ability to practice medicine? No, it does not. I just need to right. talk to somebody about the fact that that's yeah. some heavy shit, right? I think that we need to talk about that. I think that's yeah. part of what made me so ill for so many years is that I had no freaking idea how to process this. But there are, you know, I didn't know anything about cognitive behavioral therapy, acceptance commitment therapy. Like, ther therapy is not just like... It's funny when you're to the uninitiated, mm -hmm. it seems just like, you know, you're just going to blah, 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 and somebody's listening to you and they're supposed to be a safe space or whatever. Like, uh, there is, you know, you see a pretty competent person who is a cognitive behavioral therapist, like there is science behind it. There is cognitive neuroscience behind it. And lo and behold, you can actually change the way you think about things in a very scientific way. I liked that. That appealed to me. That appealed to me. The fact that there was science behind this really appealed to me. So I absolutely would encourage everybody who's dealing with this. If you don't have an acceptable support system that's outside of, you know, your job, if it's you don't have a, a spouse or partner or you don't think your friends are going to get it, one, there's probably going to be a senior physician or somewhere, someone that you can find in your group that can talk to you about this. 
your chairman's going to know. Someone's going to know someone that you can talk to who's a physician that you don't have to explain all the ins and outs about why you feel this way because sometimes you have to do that for lay people. And then if you don't have access to that or you feel like, you know what, this is really, this is getting ugly and I am not doing well. That's when you really need a professional. And the rest of it, you know, the most important thing is that you save yourself and you save your life. All the rest of this stuff, even your job, all of that stuff is secondary to you being a mentally well human being. All of those things are secondary, right? If you are thinking about killing yourself on the daily, like what good is your job? If you're, if you're picking up a bottle multiple times a day, if you are popping oxys and all of these things happen, right? All of that is secondary. You need to take care of yourself. And to do that, you probably need a professional, right? And there, the rest of it, you can find, pay cash, whatever. Talk, call it counseling sessions, call it coaching sessions, whatever, mm -hmm. whatever you want. Take care of yourself first. I think that's one of the things that stood out to me in your podcast was like when we were talking about going through this process, one, it's long, it's high stakes, and there's things that, I mean, there's so many good tips that you give in there. And, and just like we talked about a couple about, you know, seeking out like uh, professional help, you're just doing things like stack the deck in your favor. Because like, I, th I think like from, you know, a lot of physicians feel like, oh, I can take anything and, you know, I just have to grip my teeth and bear it. And that may be true for a lot of things that we do, but this is like the long haul. And so, you know what, if the worst thing in the world that you go to a couple sessions of cognitive behavioral therapy and they don't work out for you, then big deal. You know, you blew a little bit of money, but I, I think it like it, we have to like tear down that model of like that we're too strong and too tough to like go out and, and seek help, especially when it comes to mental health issues. Because like you pointed out, like in, in some of the stories that are in the podcast, the stakes are the highest. And, you know, there's a there's a story that you tell in the podcast about uh, death by suicide for a doctor. I mean, who was also dealing with a, a malpractice claim. Absolutely. And I, I think that this is a bit of a it's going to be a, a slow culture change in medicine. But I, I think everybody, everybody is benefited by a physician who's taking care of their mental health. Your patients are going to benefit. Your attorney is going to benefit because a prepared and well-adjusted defendant is a better defendant. Right? Your family's going to benefit because there is absolutely spillover from being unwell as a physician and a defendant. There is absolutely spillover into your personal relationships. Everybody's going to benefit if you take care of your mental health. Seriously, especially yeah. you, of course. But right. it's but and again, I don't you know, people do worry about like what's going to happen if I said know what's know what the rules are in your state. If you have to be smart in your state about how you go about doing it, you know what? Be smart. Just take care of yourself. Yeah. So one of the things I also wanted to talk about, which I found like extremely helpful, even even for people, uh, even for docs who aren't going through, you know, specifically a medical malpractice claim. Like I was actually called, I guess, by the plaintiff side to weigh in on a case of a like a CT I read on a patient who had some trauma from like a slip and fall accident. And but so anyway, I had to go in and give a deposition on the case. And I listened to I re-listened to your podcast about deposition prep. And I found it so extremely helpful. I mean, I felt like very well prepared going in. And I felt like this was like so inside baseball. Like I thought like for the first time I've ever given a, a deposition, I felt like a pro. Can you talk a little bit about like something that can be a very stressful uh, situation, like some tips um, for the audience members if you do have to give a deposition, whether it's with malpractice claims or something else, some of the things like stack the deck in your favor a little bit? Sure. I think the biggest thing that's going to help you is understanding the mindset going in and and learning about it so that you can control your nerves. I think the nerves are the big thing at a deposition. So you have to do a little bit of work. You got to do a little bit of work beforehand, whether it's just my listening to that podcast episode is probably the, you know, the tip of the iceberg of what you could do. But you got to know the rules. It is like going out and trying to play a sport when you have no idea what the hell you're supposed to be doing. Right. So you got to learn how to play the game. So first first stop is doing something to learn the rules. Then you got to practice. Right. If you don't want to go and make a fool of yourself, then you really have to practice because this is these are new skills. This is not how we're trained to this is not how we're trained to converse. You think you're just going to go in and answer a bunch of questions and that's that. It should be like that. It's not like that. So you have to practice how to say answers in a certain way. If you are the defendant, you are really trying to limit what you say in, at deposition. You're not trying to obfuscate and you're not trying to lie. You're not trying to change anything, but you're trying to kind of play things close to the vest. 
And because the real reason is the whole point of the deposition is, yeah, it's a fact-finding mission, but they also want you to say things that they can bring up at trial to make you look bad. That's kind of the, you know, those are probably on equal footing in terms of the things that the plaintiff's attorney wants out of a deposition. They want you to paint yourself into a corner somehow so that they can pull it out at trial and be like, hey, but you said this. Were you lying then or are you lying now? Like, that's what they want. And then they also want to, it's a, it's a fishing expedition. But the most of, you know, they probably gather a lot from the records and deposing other people, or they probably have a decent idea of what their main theme is going to be when they try to argue this case. So do not offer them any information that they don't ask for, unless it's like a huge zinger that's going to, in the podcast, I talk about this um this case where the physician who's talking about it said that their main thing was like you didn't call a neurologist, but there wasn't a reason to. There was it was a neurosurgical issue, but the attorney doesn't know the difference between a sure. neurosurgeon and a neurologist. And so she did correct them like I didn't call them because there was no indication to call a neurologist. So sometimes it's yes and no answer. Sometimes you got a little give them a little bit to be like just this is you know you should really not be suing me because this is what happened. Right. Like if, if you have the zinger in your back pocket, yes. you have the right hook. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And so my, my attorney called it like an arrow. You got to have an arrow. You, when you have, you got your arrows <laughs> and you got to know when it's time to pull out that arrow and shoot it down their throat. Like this. <laughs> <laughs> so you know what your arrows are. So that's the benefit of practicing ahead of time. So you really should be practicing with your attorney, learning. I, I actually... I talk in the podcast about how I I was like a special case. They assigned me a junior attorney to work with me because I was so bad. It was so bad. I was like filled with rage and sarcasm and just like, ugh. I was, I was terrible at this. I couldn't imagine. I couldn't manage myself. It was terrible. And so this guy worked like worked with me to make me a better deponent. And it did turn into this sort of my fair lady story where I actually got really quite good at it. But no one had ever taught me how to be or talk. <laughs> so, so there was definitely a process. So there is a process. This is not a skill set that we're comfortable with. Mm -hmm. Education is key. Practice is key. And yeah. just be beware. Know what their goal is, right? Like if you don't know that their goal is to put the ball in the hoop on the other side, then how are you going to block that? Right. You got to know what they're up to. So when you recognize what they're doing, then you can act appropriately on your side. Right. Yeah, that's what really came across to me. And, you know, we'll, of course, link to your podcast, but there are just so many good tips in there about like getting prepped, getting ready and some resources like to how to make that process like happen for you. And I really did enjoy your story about how, you know, essentially like you were you were, a, you know, a dumpster fire. And then by the time like you had uh, by the time you like you had gotten all the way through it, they're like, oh, now you're like not like a pro, but like, you know, you've been through the you've been through the ring. They, they got you coached up. Yeah, they gave like me top right. five. So I right. think that's the varsity good. squad. But yeah, right. I was definitely varsity. I, yeah. I mean, I invited my residents to come watch me testify at trial. That's wow. like that's wow. how comfortable I became. I was, I knew, I knew what I was doing. I knew how to present myself. I was very well prepared, and I was kind of emotionally as on keel as I could have imagined being. And I thought, you know what? I'm teaching this stuff. I, I, you know, I'm thinking about yeah. doing this podcast. Like, what a good experience for them. I will tell you, only a handful took me up on it. And when I asked Man. some of them, why didn't you come? They were like, I don't, I just, I just didn't think I could take it. I re so then we had to talk about like, if you can't even watch me, what's going to happen? Right. But they yeah. said they, you know, they found it too stressful. They found it too stressful. And so I think that says a lot. But yeah. yes, I did. I did get much, much, much better. And we all can. That's the thing. Mm -hmm. We're all pretty smart people. We're all pretty smart people and we're good at emotional regulation. We do that all the time, mm -hmm. right? Like how many times do you, you know, as me as an emergency physician, like I code somebody, they die and then I move on to the next room and I say, how's your ankle? I hear you sprained your ankle. What happened? So we know how to do this, but you just have to learn the rules of the game and how to manage your emotions about it. It's just a different skill set, but everybody is capable of, if I like, trust me, if I as the dumpster fire defendant can do this anybody can do this yeah yeah that whole rules of the game thing reminds me this is a, an aside but have you guys started watching squid game yet my daughter yeah. has watched it i haven't well she told me that i she thinks it's she thinks it's too violent for me it's very violent it's but pretty it, it, violent 
The, but it reminds me, like, you got to know the rules of the game. The stakes are pretty high, you know, and it's kind of like, it, it's almost it's almost like a parallel, you know. <laughs> yeah, oh we'll God. we'll link to, we'll keep it in. We'll link to Squid Game. Yeah. Sure right. well, the, good, the good news is yeah. the stakes are not that high. <laughs> yeah. I do, know, I do yeah. know the premise, so the stakes yeah. are not right. that high. Right. And that's actually something that you, we should talk about at some point is that the, the stakes aren't as high as we all feel like they are. Hmm. Right. Everybody else in that room thinks about it. It's about money. It is about money. Right. And, and so that's actually one of the things I wanted to to talk about is is that there's a lot of like feelings you can have about the other side and, and what people are doing, like as far as like the opposing attorney. But what this all boils down to is like compensation or or money. And can you speak a little bit to like how this process is de- designed to grind you down, but it's nothing personal against you. It's just one move of many strategic moves and to getting you to relent, say, uncle, mm-hmm. so, you know, the other side can get compensated. Can get paid. Right. So, when you, yeah, when you think about the plaintiff's attorney as what their job is, mm-hmm. right? I mean, they'll give you the lofty version of their job, but, like, what their job is, their job is to bring in a steady stream of income for their practice. And the way they typically do that is with settlements, Right. When a when a case goes to trial, a malpractice case goes, goes to trial, a physician wins seven out of eight times. And if you're going to trial, it's because your case is defensible because insurers really don't like taking something to trial that looks like it's not pretty buttoned up. Like if you if there is a chance that if they really think that you did have, you know, bad judgment or you you did do something that really did harm this patient, they're going to push pretty hard to settle. Uh, so most of those cases don't go to trial. Well, I mean, what Chris was saying, you know, was basically, and I, I wanted to comment on this too, Chris, is it is all about money. But for us, if it was just about money, it, it's not just about money because I'm sure a lot of docs would be happy to just say, okay, here's the money. Can you erase it from my permanent record? Because for right. all of us, it's like a big glaring F on mm-hmm. our record that we have to report. And that's what people don't realize, you know? For for us, it's 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 uh it, it is a pride thing, but it's also just that we're not used to having F's, and we don't know if if we don't feel like we did something wrong, then it's a horrible, stressful thing, mm-hmm. you know. Whether whether or not you did, you felt like you did something wrong. In a lot of ways, right. it's worse if you feel like you did do something wrong. Yeah. But that that is actually very much beside the point of the process itself, because you know, it's good to have that internal locus of I did or I didn't or whatever, but a lot of, but also like all of us screw up at some point. Mm-hmm. Right. You know, you're, you might get sued for the things that you screw up on. You might not. I've screwed up plenty. It just happens to be that my big screw ups, I didn't get sued for. And in this particular case, I don't think I didn't, I couldn't have done anything else, but, but error is just, error is a part of medicine. I, we try very, very hard to minimize that. It is impossible to be perfect at all times. That's right. just a fact. Right. But yes, to everybody else in this process, it is about money. With the exception of the, the plaintiff, I mean, I'm going to say most times the plaintiff is, I mean, yes, they might need money for care or for whatever, but they're, a lot of times their primary motivator is not actually money. Their primary hmm. motivator is that people, they feel like, they really feel like somebody hurt them. That's usually what drives it. Whether or not they have an, an understanding of medicine enough to kind of get what happened, they perceive it as somebody hurt them. And so that actually gets into a lot of the good sort of risk management pearls in terms of like the most important thing you can do for your patient is listen to them and show you that they care, that you care. Right? That's huge because a lot of times it's motivated not primarily by money, but by these feelings of somebody hurt me and they didn't listen to me and look what happened. And I can't get any answers from the hospital. Nobody's answering me, you know, because they circle the wagons. No one's going to tell you what happened. So, So there's a lot to that. So there's some of that. But everybody else who's negotiating this, it is about risk, benefit, money. So mm-hmm. attorneys, plaintiff's attorneys very much like settlements because it's guaranteed. It's a guaranteed mm-hmm. income, right? Trial is a big crapshoot. But we and our emotional response to this is the primary driver of, of what makes this so hard. And so it sounds weird. But in this case, like nothing else in the House of Medicine should be like this. But in this particular case, the more that you can you can cultivate an attitude of this being just about the money, the better off you're going to be. I know that we feel very much like we should be carrying around shame and guilt. And I don't think that's true. I just don't. I, I think that I now I think that's sort of a 
Like, why do we accept that? I mean, we care for our patients. We are well-trained. We do our very best every day. But we know a couple of things. We know that errors will happen. And we know that things we do have complications. And we know that there's no doctor out there that ever gets through a whole 30-year career without having complications or errors. And we also know that almost every doctor who practices for 30 years gets sued. So the, the weight and the gravity with which we feel this when all the other parties are thinking about this as a business decision is it's really, one, I mean, a lot of it is unnecessary. And two, it's really disadvantageous. Um, and so the, the, the sooner you can start realizing, like, this is a game of strategy. This is not about what I did. This is not whether I did something right or wrong. This is about who can manipulate the facts. This is why I think it's really important to really understand how the system works, because you go into it thinking the world works one way, as it does in medicine, where it's, these are the facts. These are the lab values. This is a differential diagnosis. This is what the patient said. This is what the exam shows. And therefore, this is the conclusion that we arrive at. Law doesn't work like that, right? The lawyer's job is to take some sort of set of facts and bend them in a certain way and make the jury think something. Primarily make a jury feel something. Mm -hmm. And then whatever the jury feels influences what they think and then decide thereafter. This does not work the way we think it does. So we can't take our doctor persona with all of that raw humanity and then bring it into the courtroom and expect that it's going to serve us because it's not. Right. And I think it's okay in this particular sphere to think like a lawyer. I think you should. I think it'd be a lot better for you. Yeah. I mean, that's one of the things that came across in your podcast that uh, you just kind of, or the suggestion was that if you were able to divest yourself of like this medical arena, the medical thinking, all this for this new arena that has some overlap about the medical stuff, but like it's, it's a different world, different set of rules, different ball game. And if you just equip yourself by knowing those rules, knowing the mindset, then you can, I mean, it's not a good experience for anybody, but you can at least like have a better experience where, you know, and, and potentially shape the out and, you know, have, and that's the big thing. It's not just to like have a better experience, but potentially have a better outcome before of it. You're more prepared. You're in a better emotional state. And th that was what came across really with your whole podcast was that if you can equip yourself with a couple of skills about this different area that we know nothing about, then you can learn to play and, you know, mm -hmm. you may actually affect how the things shake up maybe in your favor. Right. Yeah, it's like you said at the beginning, you know, the better prepared you are, the less anxiety you're going to have, the less stress you're going to have about the whole thing. Right. And there's no way to guarantee your outcome here at of course, all. Yeah. There's no way to guarantee, like, you may not have any choice over whether this case gets settled. Yeah. And there are plenty of cases that are settled over optics. This whole thing is about optics. It's mm -hmm. about optics. What does it look like? What's a jury going to think? Who? Are, what are they going to feel? Who are they going to side with? That's that's all this is about. We could say that over and over again. This is not how we think. But we could keep the sports analogy going, though. Like, you need to show up with a certain set of tools. Like, right? if you show up to a football game and you got your racket. Like, nah. <laughs> a funny concept to me. <laughs> you're not, you're not, you're not going to do well, right? you yeah, got to show yeah. up with, with some a little bit of know-how. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, that's, that's great. Um, well, Gita, uh, one of the last thing I wanted to ask you was, and uh, your podcast, of course, a fantastic resource that we'll link to, but are there any other resources that you can tell our audience about that things that you came across um, in prepping and uh, creating the content that you have that, you know, whether it be, um, you know, reaching out to uh, different professional organizations or other uh, mentors or even like academic papers on burnout and medical malpractice? Are there any other resources that we could link to in the show? There are actually more and more. I don't think mm -hmm. we're, we're rife with them at any point, at, you know, by any stretch, but I do think there are more. There is certainly a little more stuff being published about it. I recommend some of their books. Um, there are more books now. I mean, I recommend the ones that I read back in the day that made me feel better. I think there are probably more than that now. There is the, the, the first and foremost, like the big Oh, as an aside, you never say in a deposition or something that anything is like a definitive authoritative text. Just don't ever do that. Right. But okay. the definitive or the authoritative <laughs> text about litigation stress was written a ways back by a psychiatrist named Sarah Charles. So Sarah Charles, who I do, I have the privilege of, of having done an interview with you and there's a little bit of little bit of sound um, 
from where she's long retired. But so she was the first physician really to write about this. Uh, she was sued in federal court in the 1970s as a psychiatrist. Hmm. And she first she wrote a book about her experiences called Defendant. And then she wrote a book with an attorney called Adverse Events, Stress and Litigation. It is really good. And I think it informs everything else about this. And it's sort of a soup to nuts from a psychiatrist standpoint, what litigation does to the psyche of a physician, of a thinking, caring, caring, sentient human being type of physician, and why it is so hard on us. So there's a whole book about that. And then there are other books, I think, that I would recommend that are, in the podcast, I interview Dr. Eileen Brenner. She's the author of, um, oh, what is the, I got to look up the actual title. But it's um, you can look her up by the author. But basically, it's just the guide to the guide to malpractice. How to survive a medical yes. malpractice lawsuit. There you go. That's how to survive a medical malpractice lawsuit. Um, that's Great a one. very nuts bolts. Uh, she is a fellow emergency physician, so it is very much to the point. Yeah, and it's sort of like this is what's going to happen. Her father actually is a, a defense attorney, and so that he had a lot of input oh, wow. in it. So that was very helpful. There is a book called When Good Doctors Get Sued. I don't know mm -hmm. if it's available anymore, but it was that is by a PhD and a JD. It's actually not by an MD. But that book was very near and dear to my heart because until I saw the title, I just didn't think good doctors got sued. Sure. And so I there was something very comforting about the title. Just like, oh, good doctors get sued. That's good to know. And um someone gave that to me early on when it was apparent I wasn't doing well. And it was a physician who had been sued and had sort of been around the block a couple of times and was like, I think you should read this. And I took it home. I did not read it. I put it inside my bedside table, but the title was there. So when I would look at the, I would open the drawer and I would see the title and I would be like, okay, like I'll read that eventually. But like, it's nice to know that good doctors get sued. And then I would close it. It's a very, I'm sure I would make somebody like a very interesting, like psychological study in how this whole, <laughs> <laughs> like the very slow unraveling and then like, the, like, oh crap, like I need to fix this or I'm terrible things are going to happen. But yeah, it was a long time before I actually read it. And then when I read it, I was in the headspace to read it. I thought it was very, it was very good because it really speaks to this notion like nobody wants to be a bad doctor and nobody wants sure. other people to think they're a bad doctor. And that is, right. in essence, what this whole thing is about. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So until we really internalize that, you can still be a good doctor, like you are a good doctor and you got sued. Until those are not mutually exclusive in your head, then there's probably work to do. Yeah. That's great. Well, so if our audience members would like to get in touch with you or learn more uh, about your podcast, uh, where can they get some more information? It's the podcast is on Apple Podcasts, Spotify. They can just Google doctors and litigation, the L word. Um, they can find me at Brown. It's Gita underscore Pensa, G-I-T-A underscore P-E-N-S-A at Brown dot edu. And um, I'm happy to answer any questions. And I um, it's been probably I will say as a little parting thing that one of the most rewarding things about and most unexpected things about this podcast has been correspondence I get from people who've listened. And interestingly, it's not all doctors. You know, I, hmm. I, I speak as a physician because I am a physician and that's the perspective I have. But PAs get sued and Ps get sued. A social worker who got sued um, after a patient she saw in the hospital died by suicide, she reached out to me. And it was, I think it's been really helpful to me. And I was joking before we started before we started recording, I was telling you about how like there was one more episode. I and I am I am going to do it. I swear I'm going to do it. But I, you know, I I mean this curriculum up to a point, and then COVID hit, and I have a COVID episode, and I didn't release the last episode. And there's all sorts of interesting reasons as to why I haven't probably. But I I really want to, and I because I think there's there is more to say. But the whole journey for me has been so rewarding. I think because it took something that was really truly awful there's no way to there's no way to make this not an awful process there's just a way to suffer less i think but hearing from people that have found it helpful has been i think instrumental in finally being able to put this in a box and just say like okay that happened 
And in the end, something, a modicum of something good came out of it. And that's good. For sure. That's great. Thank you so much for sharing, Gita. Yeah. And, uh, you know, to our audience, thank you guys for listening. This was, uh, I don't know, this is going to rank, I think, in some of our, our, our best content. So if you guys uh, if you guys enjoyed the podcast but want more, please check out the show notes of this episode. We're going to have lots of resources that we'll link to. Those are always going to be able to found at uh, www.backtable.com. Um, that wraps things up. We'll see you next time on the Backtable podcast. Gita, thanks for coming on. Thank you for having me. 